Dun, dun, dun. What's going on, guys? We're here. We're live. Welcome to a brand new Poker Life podcast. My name is Jose Joseph Ingram One, aka Chicago Joey. I'm joined today by a man who is one of the favorite guests we've had on the podcast. He is known in the poker world as Timex. His real name is Mike McDonald or McDonald, depending on how you pronounce the name. And he's joining us again. What's up, Mike? How are you doing, Poppy? Uh, I'm doing awesome. How you been, Joe? Um, I've been pretty well. I've been doing well, man. I've been, uh, you know, we're out here grinding. We're out here grinding the podcast streets. We're here on Twitch. We're here on YouTube today. You know, I, I, we were going to do some rock climbing in Vegas, Mike, but, but we didn't get to go any rock climbing because I, I became, I became a victim to Vegas, which means I was drinking, going out every night and partying every night. So did you get to do any rock climbing when you were in Vegas? Yeah, I think I went out a few times with uh, with Lucky Chewy and with uh, Steve Chidwick. Like they're both into it, so I think I was I was only in Vegas maybe a week and a half, but still got out yeah. climbing three four days. I, I some years I don't do any partying in Vegas, but here I actually went out a few nights. So I was I was you know due to doing shitty in the main event, I was a, a victim to Vegas a little bit as well. <laughs> what did uh, what, what ended up happening with you out in Vegas this summer? Did you just what, did you just go out a couple nights and and it, you drank too much and it sort of took you out of the rhythm of playing poker? Uh, I mean, I only went down to play one tournament, so I wasn't even really in the rhythm. I was more just like went down for the main event. Let's just go, you know, lose my ten grand or win my ten million or whatever it ends up being. And this year, I decided to lose the ten grand and then just you know hang out with friends, catch up with people, climb, party, a little bit of that for the rest of the time. Yeah, my uh, my initial plan when I went to Vegas was I was there for like a month. My initial plan was like, all right, like. I you know, I'm going to grind and play some poker, do a lot of podcasts, like do a lot of videos. And then, you know, you start going out, you go out one night, you're out till 3 a.m. Next night, you're out till, you're out till 3 a.m. again. And then you just keep going out till 3 a.m. And then before you know it, it's like two weeks and you're like, fuck, man, you know, what, what's, <laughs> what's, what's, like, like, where's my life going right now? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's, I mean, it's just, it's just a fun environment there. And there's always, you know, a lot of other, you know, depressed poker players down to, down to drink as well. Like, there's, it's kind of cool where, every poker player ends up in Vegas. Like, you know, when I when I go to an EPT or something, I'll know plenty of people, but in, in Vegas, it's just, you know, everyone I've known over the last eight years in professional poker finds a way to end up there. And there's just so many people to catch up with, so much to do. It's it's kind of uh, like one, you know, one big reunion almost. No, yeah, I think it's that's like the coolest thing about it is that you get to, especially if you play online poker, you get all these guys that you know from two plus two or you know from you know from online poker on stars or you're you're friends with on skype or facebook you see them on twitter and they're all in one place they you see them you get to hang out with them some are some are ready to kill themselves some are very happy (laughs) some want to have sex with you some want to go out and party you know so it's like you get everything you want in vegas during world series like i i I, i'm never i'm never gonna miss it again like i it's it's just too much fun yeah no I, i think it's i think it's one of those things like i think you like vegas more than i do like i definitely a month in Vegas would be a bit much for me, but I think, you know, even if I, you know, stop playing poker at some point, I'll still probably come out for the main event, you know, catch up, mm-hmm. catch up with my friends who are still on the grind, all that stuff. Like, I think, I think it's just a fun, uh, like a fun vibe and a good chance to like catch up with people. But, you know, a month, two months, I've, I've done that a few times and it's a bit much for me. It kind of wears on me if I'm there for too much time. Yeah, my yeah. Obviously, like I, I was like, all right, I'm big into dieting. I think you're you're still big into the dieting, right? You still working out? Uh so basically, I, the last little bit, I've been kind of inconsistent with uh mm-hmm. with, with like how busy poker's been. Um, so I would say I've been I've been eating like fine, exercising a moderate amount, but not uh not as consistent as I have been in the past. I think mm-hmm. now that I have a life back for a little bit, I'll I'll be a little uh little more consistent the next few months. Yeah, man, you were getting out of the soul train there for a little while there, man. Oh, yeah. No, definitely. I was, uh, I think I was probably in the best shape of my life about a year ago. Hopefully, uh, hopefully try to get back to that sometime soon. What, uh, what, what changed this year ago? What happened? So, what? I mean, the biggest thing for me was getting shoulder surgery. Uh, you can't really, like, after I got, yeah, after I got that surgery, it's <laughs> tough to, you know, I couldn't work out for several months, couldn't climb for like, you know, close to a year. And I think that, um, it's you know it's tough to get jacked when you're in a sling, <laughs> so basically that was uh, that was kind of a wrench in the gears, I suppose. Remember that doctor's appointment I told you about? I gotta go to here in about an hour and a half. That better not be about a shoulder surgery, is it? Or... It's not for shoulder surgery, but it's definitely for my shoulder. So I, I, oh uh, shit, yeah, yeah that's so, rough, man. There, yeah, there. Sure I mean, sh- shoulder injuries fucking suck. What's been what's been going on with yours? Um, I'm not really sure what happened. So when I was in uh, when I was in Europe, I was doing. 
I started lifting a little bit heavier because I, I was trying to make up for lost time in Vegas because I went to Vegas <laughs> and I went to Europe for a month. I'm like, all right, like I got to like get back. I got to get back on the gains here. I got to start working out harder. So I was working out more. I was lifting heavier. I was doing a lot of pushups. And so then when I came back to the States, like, like right in this the area right here, it was just, I don't know. Anytime I lifted, it just, it just hurt. Anytime I did shoulder or chest, like right in here, it hurt. So I went to the chiropractor and I went to the doctor, got, got my usual guy who checks me out from, for sport injuries and stuff like that. And Mm -hmm. we're trying to work with that and i can't i've been doing my personal trainer i can't really do a lot of the workouts in my trainer either so i'm not sure if it's just rest or if something's yeah my my, my guess and you know i'm no professional is that right now the most the most important thing is probably like like adequate stretching and doing exercises to strengthen the parts of the shoulder that you're under utilizing and then also make like basically every exercise you want to do you know even even squatting or something like that you it's really you really want to keep your shoulders tight you know, a big thing that one of the biggest things people do is when benching, they hyperextend at the top, which, you know, un like unlocks your shoulders effectively. Like you don't like if you if you get to the top and then like unlock your shoulders, mm -hmm. it's it really uh, is tough on them for the future reps. So I think a lot of what you're probably going to need to do at this point, like it sounds as if you have like not that bad of an injury yet, but it could become much worse. And I would say just focusing on form and stretching is is and then also probably some like rehab exercises that like a physio could uh could like recommend is probably where you're at right now like i think i think basically you're probably where i was about four years ago where you experienced some pain in workouts and i just kind of you know worked it through it went heavier and heavier and then my pain turned to dislocations then my dislocations turned to more dislocations then now i'm just a fucking skinny ex bro with a shitty shoulder so you know i think that uh try to try to <laughs> Try to minimize the problem before it gets too bad. It's like that tough guy thing. You're like, fight through the pain, fight through the pain. And then you're like, ah, I fought through the pain too much. And now I got to get. Yeah, the, yeah the, the pain fought through me. Yeah. Is, yeah. is uh, you know, I, that's, that's my advice is, yeah, definitely, you know, address the problem before it becomes too bad. Yeah, I usually done that in the past. Anytime I have a, any sort of soreness or injury, like I either get it checked out or I just take it a little bit easy on there. I know a lot of guys are like, ah, fuck it. <laughs> I think my, I think, my, I think I got a torn, I think I got a torn like ligament in my arm. I'm gonna fucking lift real heavy still. I'm just like, man, you're, <laughs> oh, you're tripping right now. I mean, that, that could be cool for right now, but down the road, that's gonna be a, that's gonna be some issues for yourself. So. Oh yeah, no, it's one of those things, especially you know, you're getting into lifting, you're making gains. It's so easy to get obsessed with that. Obsessed with you know, adding five more pounds. Obsessed with you know, looking a little better. And it's easy to like kind of neglect the fact that you know, maybe you're upping your chances of like you know, ending up in a wheelchair. So, you know, I don't know what it would be, but like you're all these things that like risk injury, fighting through injuries can like, they can become really bad if you're like, uh, if you go, you know, if you go too serious and don't, don't kind of listen to what your body's telling you. Yeah. I think, um, I think I've, you know, when you're younger, you always, you always want to be the strongest, the biggest guy in the world. You want to be the strongest guy in the world. You want to have the biggest arms. So you sort of like really ignore those things. And I think what happens is once you become a, that, once you become like more intelligent, like, oh, wait, I shouldn't do that to my body. It's like almost too late for some people. So yeah, it, it's sometimes good. Do you think going forward, you're going to have much, uh, much issues lifting? Do you think like, what's up with the shoulder right now? Okay. So basically like the, the things with my shoulder right now are, so my strength is largely back, but mobility especially regarding like external rotation is pretty minimal. Uh, so there are certain things that I should, ne you know, basically never do. Like my physio says, never do dips for the rest of my life. Um, the one thing that I hate and I feel like, I feel like such a pussy every time I do this is they say never, never bench with a full range of motion. So, you know, those guys you see, you know, they're doing massive weight and they're benching like fucking three inches above their chest or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Like I've, I've fucking become that person that I hate <laughs> that basically, you know, they say probably don't bench till more than like, I probably benched like an inch and a half above my chest because after that it kind of, it gets tougher on the shoulder right. and that range of motion is, it's a lot weaker. So I feel, I always feel bad, you know, if I'm like, ask some dude for a spot in the gym and I'm just, you know, he's like, I'm have, I'm this guy with, you know, the, in my opinion, you know, terrible form. And I'm, I want to be like, look, no, it's, I have an injury. I'm doing what my physio said. It's not like I just want to add an extra 10 pounds on by making the exercise easier. This is like, this is by design that I'm, you know, you know, benching like a pussy. So that's, th those are probably the two main things. I still do a, a little bit of stretching, a little bit of rehab, just mm -hmm. constantly trying to like add mobility. But, you know, I think that, um, I haven't felt pain in my shoulder now, basically since the surgery, and it's gone pretty well. 
All right, guys. Well, we are here on live on YouTube or on Twitch. If you have any comments, questions, please ask them in the chat. I will try to get to as many as we can. We just started the podcast. Uh, someone did mention something, which I will comment on, which uh, Kishi said, my weakness from lifting is in my wrist. You, could tr you should try getting gloves that have a wrist support on there. You, you can basically wrap it around right here, and that can really help with, your, with any wrist uh, soreness that you have. That I used to have that back when I was younger, and I got gloves, and I was like, oh, wait, no more wrist pain. So that is something you could try. Uh, a bunch of people say foam rolling. I, I foam roll. I stretch a lot all the time. Luckily, so I, do you foam roll uh, too, Mike? I, I own a foam roller, but and I know I should use it, but I don't use it nearly as much as I should. Yeah, so it's so I I just every time I watch TV or I watch like a TV show, I just foam roll. Like that's that's what I do the entire time because it just feels. I mean, like it feels like it unlocks your body, especially for climbing or for yoga or for stretching or anything like that. It just like sort of opens up your legs, opens up your back, opens up your body, and makes you feel so bad. Yeah, there, there's so many things that I just like, I know are good, and I'd be like, yeah, that's good advice, and then I don't do it myself. I would say foam rolling is pretty high up on that list where I, you know, I think I bought my foam roller like six years ago, and I've used it maybe five times, or, you know, mm. like, basically, basically, I don't foam roll. Tragic, man. That's tragic. I know. That's probably why I get injured. It could be. Yeah. You know, I haven't, I haven't, yeah, it could, could be. Uh, Mad says, holy shit, Poppy sponsored by Nike now. Nope, we're not sponsored by Nike today, guys. This, uh... Nike's not gotten in touch with me. DraftKings has not gotten in touch with me. We're not sponsored by either one of those today. I'm sure uh, it's just a matter of time. He'll, they'll, they'll be hitting you up in no time. I agree. Ivan says, Puppy, Mamacita, Rika, Chamicha, Chamicha, Maya, let's party. Top three favorite guests. I like it. What's up, Ivan? <laughs> 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 All right, guys. We're going to be talking about... Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, Timex's three... He made three, he made three final tables during the WCOOP, right? Yeah, three W Coop final tables is pretty uh pretty fun, that's for sure. Man, they 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 weren't been they haven't been saying you're washed up, are they? You, you, I mean, I, I'd no. say I'd say I'd say I have a a little bit of washed up to me. Like I think that I think I've, there are times when my game has been sharper. Um, I mean, I've been running good lately. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I've been playing fine, but not great. Uh, but winning all ins and shit. Listen, three final tables. I don't care what they say. I think that you got to be good to make three final tables, don't you? <laughs> no, <laughs> I mean <laughs> you're you're more likely to make three final tables if you are good. But I mean, tournament poker is just so ridiculous. You know, there's uh, stranger things have happened than a washed-up player making three final tables. All right, guys, we're also gonna be talking about uh, some comments Mike made about a young a young um, a young account, an account from Russia, and a Russian account, Nobleva. Oh yeah. And, we're gonna be talking about the Zoom five hundred prop it a little bit, and we'll... oh, all my all my favorite topics. I know. I was, you know, what's funny is I'm writing these down. I'm like, man, <laughs> I like Fucking don't. Wanna, I like I have to talk. About, I don't necessarily want to talk about these ones, but I, you know, like, yeah, uh, we, yeah, like... we we can rush through them real quick. All my uh, all my many uh, you know accomplishments. <sighs> Which one should we start with, Poppy? Uh, it do doesn't matter. We can go chronologically if you want to go through the Zoom challenge first. No, I don't. Let's start okay, with the 51K, no, okay. let's let's start with the 51K the tournament. So you made the okay. final table of that, right? <laughs> yeah, so made the, made the final table of the 51K. You know, that was that was pretty sweet. Uh, final tabled it with the chip lead. My outcome was not uh, – my outcome of the final table was not what I had hoped for, but it was uh, it was still nice to, you know, get fifth in an event like that. So fifth was uh, – fifth. What, what was the fifth take home there? I think it paid out seventh. Uh, yeah, I think top six paid, I think it was something like 160 or 170. Yeah, so like three, three and a half buy-ins. Did you, uh, I know you entered, you were the last person to enter. You entered like at the last second possible, yeah. right? I, I don't think it was last second. It was in the last few minutes. Uh, but ba I'm not going to lie. Um, so I expected the field to be relatively tough. Um, but it would end up being very tough. Like if, if I were to guess, I would have thought there's going to be 60 players I'm going to be the 15th best player would be about what I would think as it was, it was probably 45 players and I'm the 20th best player or something like that. And so I'm sitting, I was sitting there on the sidelines and like, and I'm not going to lie. I was pretty shook. Like I was like, Oh God, we've got you, you know, we're looking at the field. First of all, what happens is, you know, in the field, I think it was 45 people play professionally and the first person eliminated is the one non-professional, you know, just gets massively, gets massively coolered. And then we see, you know, the chip leaders, Red Baron, like the, you know, second in chips is true teller. Like, it's just like all the, like, all the best players who, you know, are, you know, do 
so well that it's not even worth their time to play live super high rollers are the ones who are running up stacks in this thing. And I was like, oh, give me a fucking break. Like, this, this is just the, it was like the worst tournament of all time. And like, the elite players are overperforming, basically. So I was basically, about an, an hour left in late registration, I was fairly set on not playing. Um, and then basically what ended up happening is a few more professionals registered who I don't think were necessarily the best players in the field. A few other of the weaker professionals started running up stacks. That Nopa Leva, who I assumed was kind of going to be a massive fish, ran up the chip lead after being short stacked. And I was like, yeah, you know, these... Chips are falling in good directions, you know, like Baron and True Teller are no longer first and second in chips and, you know, things like that. And I was just like, ah, the field is like, even though it's the same players in the field, like the, the chips are flowing in good directions to where it's fairly likely that people that you want in the field are going to go deep. So, you know, uh, ended up, you know, registering with, you know, a few minutes left right from the get go ran good, won my all ins, sucked out on your boy Fedor. And then, uh, you know, made it down to the final table. <laughs> Sucked it on my boy Fedor, huh? Yeah, exactly. Oh. It was it was pretty brutal. What was the hand? Was it ace-king versus kings or something like that? <laughs> no, it was ace-five suited against ace-king. Oh, yeah. Ball. People, oh, is Timex done? Is he? Does he forget how to play tournaments? I think that was the that was the reading that I read about this. I read some comments oh, like, what is this God. guy a fucking idiot now? What happened to this guy? I'm like, what are the good things? Oh, man. I, 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 I could be wrong. I could be... I could be misjudging Fedor's impression of me, but I think I think that play was great. Like you know, I did get it. You know, I did get it in for the chip lead bad, but I am. Uh, I think given our previous dynamics, that is just a sweet hand. Like basically, I think uh, effectively, if we were to kind of go through. Uh, our views on each other. I kind of think Fedor views me as someone who rarely makes big mistakes and won't won't put it in super light. And then as a result of that, I think he's four bet inducing way less than he would against a lot of rigs. Like I think against I, I think there's some people who people will induce like nines east queen suited like cutoff button for like you know 60 bigs or whatnot. But I think against me it's entirely like I think it's entirely possible he just calls my three bet with jacks there. Um, I, I I could be wrong about this, but I think it's like, he could be queen's ace king to induce, and then also given that I think with a lot more of his offsuit broadways that he doesn't think he can call profitably with, he'll decide to four bet because he probably doesn't want me. He probably anticipates I don't want to fuck up. So I think his, and I also think Fedor is like um, of like hyper aggro players, one of the people who's uh, smartest and like most exploitive as far as you know even though he's got an aggro image he's not just gonna like four bet get it in with nines because he's aggro i mean in this case it would have been right against me but i think that it, over a previous history that hasn't been indicative of the type of thing that i usually do so i think given all of our previous history like in in the hand he basically he tanked down and seemed you know not like basically he, he tanked down and then called ace king like he knew he's calling ace king there was no oh he almost folded it was more just like, oh shit, I'm getting it in, you know, ace king against a jacks plus ace king range. Like I think, I think he was, basically, I feel like he was disappointed that he's about to get coolered in this 50k buy-in tournament. I don't think he was like, I think he was unhappy with that. Like he knows he needs to four bet and do ace king there, but I don't think he was happy about that given our history and his view on my playing style. So I think that his induced range was particularly tight. And I, I think his 4-bit bluff range was wider than it would be because he doesn't expect me to have much light range. So I think, I mean, you know, as it was, you know, I got it in as a 30-70 for a massive pot, a little bit of ICM suicide. But I think that, I, when I, like, I think in isolation, like, I can't make a play like that a large percent of the time because otherwise people start, you know, inducing ace-jack suited and shit like that. Right. But I think that... Uh, I think that, you know, I've had hundreds of people tell me how bad I am for that hand, but I think it was, I, th I think it was my best played hand of the tournament. Like, maybe, uh, maybe that's wrong, and maybe Fedor is laughing, like, laughing at this right now, thinking he was 100% value in that spot, and I'm just, like, dead wrong. I don't really know, but I, I think it was, uh, I think it was a good hand. Well, only if Fedor was still streaming on Twitch, he could let you know his thought process, huh? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw, uh, guys, go ahead. Why did he stop streaming on Twitch? Well, what do you, why do you think he started to stop streaming on Twitch, Mike? What would you um, get if you were gonna guess? Like, what if you start streaming on Twitch? You never streamed on Twitch, and then you stopped after a couple of days. What? Why would you? Why would you think that? 
maybe like I don't know haters paying it like uh, getting mad at him or something like I don't really know. Like I basically, if I were in Fedor's shoes, I would have just never started in the first place. But I feel like he he got like it seemed like he got started. You know, viewed it as like a positive thing, and I feel like he had. I feel like he had thought about the downsides of it, so I don't really know what sort of like unforeseen downsides there would be. Um, so, I, so what happened was is that this is what he told me is that he's playing. He just couldn't focus on the games, which 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 is really hard to do. I mean, he want he's playing yeah, okay. like he couldn't focus. Like he's okay, playing. That's he, wants, he doesn't want to. He doesn't want a one table like some of the other guys do on stream. He wants to play more tables. So. He can't really communicate with the chat and talk about. I'm sure. He, I'm sure after he started talking about strategy, he was like, "Oh wait, eh, this might like everyone's watching this. This might not be the the most uh, smartest idea for me to be talking about what I'm thinking about and how I play in these situations." So I think it's like yeah. a combination of those two things. No, that uh, that definitely makes a lot of sense. Like I think I feel like he kind of knew that he'd be giving up, you know, plenty of strategy advice and plenty of edge kind of thing. Uh, but I, I didn't even think about how much more focus streaming t like takes. Like I, I sometimes stream this like video game that I play, and when I play it, I play so much worse. Mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely it's tough to do multiple things at once. So I can I can totally uh, understand that situation. Yeah, I think that's what happened. I think sometimes you might like, especially if you play at a high level, it's really hard to be paying attention to the chat. Especially you, especially for him, he's got so many people in there. There's so many comments going down the side. And then now you're trying to focus, you miss out on a spot, you get a little bit tilted, and then, you know, it sort of all starts backing up. And... And, and and this, yeah, and I also think there's something to be said that, like, a lot of the guys streaming right now, like, they don't really play a style where they're giving up that much by streaming. Like, you know, basically, I think I feel like Negrano, him streaming gives up a lot, but Negrano's just, like... He's just so paid that, like, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't, he's not too concerned about, you know, people earning a few percent off him in the 50K or whatnot. Not really. But, he's, so you're saying he's kind of not really a professional poker player. I mean, he's a professional poker player, but he's not making all of his income from poker like a lot of people are. Ex exactly. It's, it's a different, he's in a different sort of tier than the rest of us where his main motivations aren't financial. It's, you know, growing the game of poker, growing the Poker Stars brand, you know, playing against the best, you know, stuff like that is more important than earning every dollar he can. And then a lot of the other streamers, they're, you know, they're kind of, they, I guess they're like professional players as well, but they're not professional players in the way that Fedor is, where Fedor is, you know, he's, you know, he's on the forefront of, you know, of poker strategy. He's, you know, ahead of the game, like ahead of most regs. Like say you take, if every reg is kind of, you know, at this level, Fedor is kind of like a year or two ahead and I feel like most other streamers are like a year or two behind. And it's just like he's in such a different place where you just have, you know, you just have someone who's crushing games, one of the biggest winners. For And their strategy is so much about exploiting regs. And then a lot of the other streamers, they're in a spot where those same regs are exploiting the streamers kind of thing. It's like basically fe like when Feeder started streaming, I was just like, fuck, man, what are you doing? <laughs> like, this is like, you know, you're going to put us all out of work if you keep doing this. So, you know, I'm glad that I'm glad he had focus issues because, you know, I, I might need to find a new job if, you know, too many guys like Fedor start streaming poker. Yeah, I was, thinking about, that there, I was thinking about that the other day on streaming on Twitch is that, like, a lot of people really aren't giving up that much when they stream because, like, the players are already better than them. So it doesn't necessarily... <laughs> Like, it doesn't necessarily matter, like, if they're... And the people that are watching are going to be normally better than that are playing with them. Mm -hmm. Whereas, like, so, for instance, I'm, I'm going to use Jay Nand as an example for PLO. Like, I think Jay Nand, he streams 2-5 Zoom, but I think he's already, like, I don't know if he... He's, like, he's... I feel like he's probably much bigger winner in that pool. So, he like, the, the bat... The, he's just going to beat the most of the regulars in that pool anyway, and some players are going to get better. But at the same time, if he was streaming, like, 10-20, I think that'd be a terrible mistake because... Yeah. Then those guys are better than him, and then they get to watch him play. So now they understand how to take advantage of what he's doing. Whereas the guys at two five Zoom might not necessarily know how to take advantage of anything he's doing. So it's not like he's really giving up that much to his players in the game in that instance. Yeah, that's a good example, and that's sort of like that's sort of how I felt when I saw Negrano streaming four hundred eight hundred mix. Is like first of all, like I don't think Negrano thinks that streaming four hundred eight hundred mix is like a good financial decision. I think it's more just he wants to play in the like in the tough lineups he doesn't really mind you know giving up an edge but like the guys he's playing against are like you know they're all some of the best poker brains in the world who will just be so good at like extrapolating you know fr like the you know the types of hands he's opening in what games the types of like tricky plays he makes like they'll be able to make such good deductions 
from seeing every hand that it's like, you know, I, I just imagine all these like guys who, you know, crush 400, 800 mix must have just, you know, over a few hours of that gotten such a strong handle on his game. Whereas if they were to just play a couple hours without all cards being face up and without all thought processes being explained, they probably wouldn't have had that big of an edge or learned that much. But, you know, I just think it's, I think it's one of those things where, you know, the, you're, when you're just, you know, even if Negrano has a bunch of like plays that, you know, give him a big edge and are exploiting these regs and, you know, he's the biggest winner in the game, a few hours of, a few hours of watching the, of like what he's doing and he'll be the biggest loser in the game kind of thing. Like it's, it's really like basically when you're, when the people watching you are sufficiently smart and sufficiently reactive, you just can't have an edge in that spot. Yeah, I think um, I think Negrano had a maybe had a winning session the first time he did it, or a big winning session. So I think that might sometimes like to the viewers watching that might think, oh, it's fine, or to even himself, he might be like, oh, it's not a big deal. I mean, obviously, there's variance in poker. There is a very short, it's a very small sample, but like I, I completely agree with you in that in, in that instance. Yeah, I think I think he was winning a fair bit when he started doing it. I don't know how much I don't know how many hands or sessions he logged. I only watched once or twice, um, but I think that like you know. I think long term, no one can win uh, doing that. Like, I think maybe say you take a game like Limit Hold'em, if you're the best Limit Hold'em player, and you like stream for a year, you know, like, so, okay, let's say you spend a year training with like Cepheus or whatever it's called, and then you spend a year streaming using your findings from Cepheus, you might still be able to beat people because you're playing like a bot, anyways. <laughs> but like in, a, in in any other format of poker, like I would I would guess say you take say you take someone who's like number one at their game, like say you take you know Doug at Heads Up No Limit or OTB Red Baron at Six Max No Limit, if they had to stream all their poker for the next year, they're not going to be the number one player. Like it's just there's they basically would just give up all of the information that they've acquired that's made them the best, shared it with people so people can emulate that, but also figure out how to exploit that. And it's just, you know, over over enough time, you're like, it, it's just, it would be so, you know, arrogant to think you're so much smarter than the people that you're playing against that you can, you know, tell them what you're doing, but then always stay like one step ahead of them and then, you know, exploit their exploits. Like it's, I think it's just... I don't think there's anyone in poker who's so much smarter than their opposition that they could give away everything they have and still be beating them. So what do you, when we think about somebody like Taika, Phil Gathon on a run at once, do you think, I guess he's probably not giving everything away because he's been making videos now for a long time, but he's still, he's still winning at PLO. So. I mean, I would, I, I would guess like, well, so first of all, there's a big difference between making like a one hour video once a week and like streaming your sessions live kind of thing. Agreed. Um, and then also, you know, explaining thought processes. Uh, so I think, and then I don't know that he's holding stuff back. I would guess he's not given he's, you know, building a business around these things. So I, I don't know for sure, but my, I would guess that he's, uh, just, you know, very, like very good at the game. Uh, PLO has stayed softer than a lot of games because there's so much like recreational money. Like say you took Phil Gelfond and put him in six max no limit instead of instead of uh, six max and heads up PLO. I would guess he would have you know fallen behind the times and been like probably a losing player at this point because the environment is so much more competitive and the game so much more developed. Uh, I can't I can't say for certain, but I think that you know the the more uh, the more reg filled and the more hardworking the regs are at the game, the uh, the easier it is to get. Uh, you know, crushed by people using your content against you. All right, guys, uh, we're getting a lot of comments in, on Twitch and YouTube. We, we will get to some of the best ones as we uh, as we get on with the cast. Actually, we're only we're gonna be going for about uh, 40, 50 more minutes today, and uh, time time flies, man. Mike, Mike, time fucking flies, man. Oh yeah, I guess How's... we. Ne I never answered the question about the no believer stuff. No, we didn't get into the question. I didn't. I didn't get to. I didn't oh, get to the point. No, no, we're not no, gonna. I'm. I'm. No, listen. I'm gonna get to that later. I'm gonna make people watch. You're it gonna, all right. All right. All right. About that. So you you mentioned yeah. something about uh you mentioned something about about Zoom, and yeah. Phil Gaffin might <laughs> Phil Gaffin might be a loser at Zoom. So yeah. you, you had a recent prop bet at at two five Zoom on Poker Stars where well, well and we talked about this last time you were on a little bit but you don't want to get too much yeah. into it but then NVG thread got started of course because that's what oh, happens. Yeah. And, yeah, so basically, uh, so basically, I had—I uh, guess I can go through all the details. I had 
uh, like a 600% cross book on whether I'd beat those games. And I lost, I lost the bet. It was, I'm not going to lie. It was, it was very emotionally tough on me. Like it was, I think I was going through some other stuff in life, like at the same time that was, you know, not, not very positive. And this kind of, this coincided with making the bet. And I, I, I'm not going to lie while making this zoom bet, it's the hardest I've worked at poker in my life. Like, you know, I just wake up in the morning, you know, I'd be studying, I'd be going over my hand histories. I'd be like analyzing the regs. I'd be watching videos. Like I was, I worked so hard. Uh, it was, it was basically all I was focused on and I was losing. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm fairly certain I ran bad. It's tough to know just how bad, but it really, like, I've never felt so washed up in my life. Like I basically, the way I, the way I described it to, to one of my friends is it would be like, let's say, you know, let's say you're like Kobe Bryant, you're at the end of your career, you know, your people are surpassing you. You're, no one, ever, no one thinks you're anywhere near the top in the world anymore. And then, you know, maybe you get a chance to go play like, uh, you see there's a basketball game down at the local high school, you know, figure this is a chance to go get your confidence up, drop from super high rollers down to mid stakes, and then go get fucking rocked by some high schoolers. This, this is like what, you know, what things sort of felt like where on the one hand, you know, I think I'm a winner in these fucking hundred thousand, two hundred fifty thousand dollars buy-in tournaments and without working very hard and then go fucking work my ass off, play two, five zoom, and then just, you know, like, yeah, I don't know, run bad or play bad, whatever, whatever it happens to be, lose and then continue losing, work even harder, continue losing. And I think that, I think if I was like, I mean, the the bet lasted about six months or so. And after about two minutes or uh, two, two and a half months, I like threw in the towel and didn't play uh, any more hands. And I think I was just sort of not, uh, kind of made me realize I'm not as emotionally tough as I like to think I am. Like I was definitely, I mean, I would just, you know, if I have a day where I would like, you know, win three buy-ins, I'd be like, all right, whatever. And then I'd have a day where I lose three buy-ins and I would just be like going over the hands that like, you know, I lost pots and just like hating myself so much. I'd go to sleep, you know, thinking about like what I need to do tomorrow, what I need to study, how I need to like, you know, perfect these ranges. Like I was, I was trying so hard and losing and it was just a real like, yeah, probably the biggest shot to my ego I've ever had at anything. Like it was, it was pretty emotionally tough on me. So, you you've been playing much cash games in your career pre- previous to that, correct? Um, I not in recent years. Like I I think that I was like I would guess in my life I've probably still played uh maybe half a million to a million hands of cash or something like that. But that was mostly pre two thousand ten. Like mm-hmm. I played very little cash since two thousand yeah nine two thousand ten kind of thing. It seems um, like the logical thing to do would have been start lower. I mean, obviously you don't want to start lower, but just to get some confidence, like have some things work, figure out what's working, uh, work on making it work better, and then sort of moving your way up instead of just jumping in with guys who have been playing every day for the last six years or five years or something like that in the cash game street. Yeah, I mean, I guess like, yeah, I guess 2-5 Zoom is like, uh, like, I mean, it feels small, but I guess it still is. Like people were telling me 2-5 Zoom is probably comparable to like, you know, 10-20 in other games. But, you know, I still play with like, when we play tournaments, I still play with, you know, guys who are, you know, 10, 20, 25, 50, 200, 400 regs and are, you know, are used to how they play kind of thing. Like, it's not, it's not as if I've never encountered, a, you know, someone who's as tough as a 2-5 zoom reg in all my poker play or anything like that. So, and I think that there's, there's a little bit to be said that like, say most, most of my cash play has probably been like 10, 20 to 50, 100, but obviously, you know, 2-5 in today's game is a lot tougher than like 50, 100 in 2007 or something like that. Um, so it's definitely uh, a different uh, a different environment kind of thing. Um, I think that, and also I, I have, the one thing going into this bet is I had previously, you know, I had played maybe 30,000 hands of Zoom in 2014 and like, you know, God moded, like maybe one at like nine BB per hundred or something like mm-hmm. that. Um, and it was just like, oh, you know, these, these games are a joke. Uh, but basically I think that uh, you know, ran hot then, you know, played shit or ran shit now. I, I don't like, I think it's one of those things where, you know, I still think I should be winning at those games. And especially if I'm, you know, if I'm working hard, I think I, I think I should be winning, but it's, it's definitely, I've, I've much less, like if I had certainty, I would have uh, continued with the challenge rather than just log no hands for the last few months. The fact that I log no hands is kind of indicative of the fact that, you know, I, 
you know, I felt like it was a bad life decision to continue. Like I was, it was really making me, uh, pretty, uh, pretty bummed out on, you know, my like, whatever self-worth, like, you know, when poker has been the thing I've put the most time into, it really was such a big, uh, shot to, you know, shot to my self-confidence, just, you know, trying, trying the hardest I have in years and just, you know, getting, getting brutalized. So it was, uh, yeah, it was definitely, I don't know. It was, it was lame. Sometimes it does take you know, months, maybe longer than two months, even even a year, a year and a half before you, you start winning in that type of game, though. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I still think it's like I've, I've logged so many hands at poker in my life. And I also have, you know, like one thing is, you know, I could send hand histories to friends kind of thing. You know, if I have if I have friends who are, you know, in my social circle who are down to like, you know, give me advice who are, you know, beating 2550 for a high win rate it seems like you know who it seems weird that i cannot you know you know not beat two five kind of thing uh i don't know it definitely made it definitely made you know that's a, a big factor in me uh you know considering myself washed up like if i can if i can give it my all and just not uh not fucking you know compete at mid stakes like fuck what do i have yeah, I guess it's, uh, I mean, obviously it's a, you know, very different animal tournaments, uh, cash games where you're playing, you know, you're sometimes playing 200 big blinds deep in a lot of these different situations. It's, mm-hmm. you know, it's like blind versus blood and see pet fold. It's just so many of that. And, and the bet sizing strategy is the approach to bet sizing in general. Of cash games is generally so much different than it is at tournaments. So it's like, I feel like you almost need to rewire your entire brain. But when you do that, now you're getting stronger at cash games, but you're going to get worse at tournaments in the process because just because you're not staying at the highest level you can in that situation. So it's like, do you yeah. really want to focus so much time on this when you don't know what will happen? Mm-hmm. If then if your main game might suffer and you might set yourself back to a point where you might not be able to, like who knows what could happen at that point in time. Yeah, I mean, I do think it all comes down. Like I do think that, you know, there's something to be said that I, I think, you know, you work on your PLO game, it'll help your no limit game. You know, you work on your, you know, it, you just under, improving your general poker sense, I think helps. I do think it can, you know, make you slightly, slightly rusty if you spend too much time away from your, your main game. But I think that just kind of, you know, if, if I'm making, I think one of the, one of my strengths as a poker player, like, uh, has always been uh, only ever making a play where I can understand why I'm making the play. Like, I think a lot of guys do something because they were told to do it or, you know, they saw it in a video or something. Like, I've I've always been, you know, even from the time I was, you know, just like 16, 17 or whatnot, I've always been, like, hypercritical of, you know, just because someone good is saying something, that doesn't mean that it's right. And just kind of, you know, really trying to analyze why, why I'm doing something in a certain situation. And I, I think that kind of having that mentality pretty strongly ingrained into me, I think allows me to... Um, you know, if I'm making these plays in cash games, like not just blindly applying them to tournaments just because, you know, they work in cash games kind of thing. Like, I think that, I think I would be reasonably good at, you know, kind of separating the, you know, you know, the two beasts from each other. Like, I think, I think Mm -hmm. it's just because I'm doing one thing in one game doesn't mean I'll do it in the other, I guess. Do you think that, um, that some of the, the the Zoom regulars at 2-5 could beat high stakes tournaments or beat tournaments in general if they... I guess they play tournament. That was a question someone asked. I, I guess I'm curious about that as well, too. Yeah, do you think they could beat high-stakes tournaments that you play? Okay, ba- basically, I think that six max no limit is a much more competitive environment than high-stakes tournaments. Um, so I think that basically with the same amount of time committed, uh, six max cash players could convert to good tournament players much quicker then good tournament players could convert to good six max cash players. And it's like, it's not even a question. It's not even same ballpark, but there still is that, you know, that degree of learning curve kind of thing. Like, let's say, let's say the amount of time it takes for me to become an elite six max cash player is like two years. Let's say that's the time it takes, like, let's just say that were the time, you know, if I were to put all my effort into it, it takes two years before, you know, I'm a reg who can open sit 2550 or something. The amount of time it takes for like, you know, a reg who's open sitting 2550, who's never played a tournament before to be a good tournament player is like two days or, <laughs> well, not two days, but like, but way quicker than two, two like, it's, a, it's not even in the same like uh, hmm. order of magnitude. Like they could, you know, I think, you know, some of the guys who say played the 50K, like, you know, guys like, 
who I hardly ever see in tournaments, like someone like a Juka Poker, or there were, you know, uh, I think Four Haley played it. Like they're they're obviously like uh, high six cash players who play a lot of tournaments. Like you know, Fish twenty thirteen, you see him in like every you know live tournament. You see a couple of the other like high six cash players. Like those guys are effectively already the best tournament players. Uh, but like the guys who have hardly ever seen in any tournaments, uh, I think are still you know winners in that 50k field and often bigger winners than a lot of the tournament specialists are so i think that it's just you know i think that say you were to say you were to take one of those guys and they've never played a tournament i i think they'll just be you know okay but i think that it, after a very small amount of tournament experience uh they'll you know the best six max cash players will become the best tournament players I think you kind of see that with, uh, like, you know, Big Dick Dong or Kim has been recently transitioning over to tournaments. Obviously, WCG Ryder. I don't know if these guys are considered good at tournaments or not, if they're fun players in these tournaments, or Jason Less or even Jason Moe. So you kind of see those guys. They didn't have much tournament experience, I don't believe, and they sort of just jumped into the high-stakes tournaments. And although, to be fair, I don't know if they've had that much success at these high-stakes tournaments. So, But obviously, variance and, and small sample size so far, too, for them. So. Yeah, I th- I, so I think, I mean, I think those guys pretty quickly picked up tournaments. I also think that uh, having, you know, familiarity with six max cash is a lot more important than heads up cash. Like, first of all, you know, you're, especially the guys who play like six max anti cash, like the, you know, s- like playing, you know, anti list poker versus anti poker is a substantial difference as well. And playing with two people at the table versus, you know, six to nine people at the table is a big difference as well. Uh, like, I think, you know, certain things like, like just, you know, push botting or, you know, short stack, you know, get it in ranges is just something that you don't really think about the same way in, uh, in like, you know, in heads up games versus in six max games. Like I know a a friend of mine uh, talks a lot of strategy with all those guys. And whenever, you know, whenever they're talking about, you know, calling off ranges against short stacks, like he's convinced they're always wrong, basically. Um, So it's sort of, like I think aspects of their play, like you know, like hand reading and you know, under like understanding of like the deep sack situations, those guys will be among the best in the world. But certain I think tournament concepts are not that relevant to like they're, they're it's not an easy transition from playing you know from playing heads up to having ideal you know like there, when you're playing there is no there is no cutoff there is no hijack there is no under the gun in a heads up game and mm-hmm. understanding the ranges to be played against those spots it's easy to misjudge them if you just don't have a lot of tournament experience all right guys um give a couple of shout outs here We've gone a little bit in time i've been getting a couple of shout outs uh, roller coaster on twitch says is it possible to download your podcast i'm loving it well, well shout out to you but uh you can check them out on youtube join your one or on twitch or i'm sorry on itunes join your one or poker live podcast uh, we got a couple of comments, guys. Obviously, we got a lot of questions from Mike today from, from you guys out here. So I'm going to try to pick some out. But, but uh, you know, I already have a couple of questions lined up. And they'll, they'll be able to go on. I, I don't know. I, I, can, I can get Mike to talk about some of these topics for, uh, for, about, for about an hour. Let's talk about the No Beloved thing. So actually, I didn't give shout outs. Hold on a second. Let me give a shout outs, Poppy. I, I got to get, let me at least give like three shout outs here. Let me see who's in the chat, man. Who's out here right now? My boy, Bradley Warner, Puppy, Martin Van Hoost. What's up, Martin? Alexis, what's up, Alexis? How much did he lose in the games? Yeah, how much did you lose in these two five zoom games, kid? I think I lost like twelve or thirteen k. Oh my god, it's not even a lot of money. It's like oh, twenty with, with, twenty with some the, buy-ins with the cross oh, with the crossbook. It was like, uh, like, uh, like ninety k with the crossbook. Yeah, uh, cross but, yeah, it was. I mean, it wasn't an insane amount of money, and the the sample size was only fifty thousand hands. And I, this is kind of why I like a lot of a lot of regs came in, and they're like, you know, lol, I've lost, you know at twice that rate for 50,000 hands, like keep your head up or whatnot. But like, this is what I mean when I say I don't have the, I mean, maybe they just wanted me back in the player pool because I'm such <laughs> a fish. Uh, but basically this is what I mean when I say I don't have, you know, I don't have the emotional toughness that I thought I did. That this was like, you know, I've been on way bigger downswings than 90,000. You know, I've lost 90,000 in a day on many occasions. Uh, and this was, you know, spread out over a few months, but it's still just, there's something I was, I was talking to Pratt about this recently that like Ooh. when you're, uh, Wait, who were you talking to? Sorry, who? who uh, was it? PLP, Pussy Love and Pertouche. Oh, PLP. Okay, yeah, yeah PLP. So, all right, all right. I've been yeah, sure you're talking about for a second. Yes, yeah, I was talking. Yeah, I was talking to PLP himself, and we were talking about how you know how your confidence can get shaken up in different games. And for you know, for both of us, we're so confident in our tournament game that nothing, you know, no no downswing is really going to affect our confidence levels. But when you're learning a new game and you don't yet have it, you know, as a part of your identity that you're good at that game. 
you know, losing sessions, you know, bad decisions, misthinking spots, it affects you so much more. And mm -hmm. it's sort of like, you know, it would just it would just be like, you know, let's say I'm playing, you know, the biggest pot of my life in a tournament. If I'm right, you know, if I'm right versus wrong, it could, you know, affect my, you know, financial position like half a million dollars or something like that, like, you know, a final table of some tournament or whatnot, and I guess wrong, and then I, you know, think more about the situation, realize, you know, I fucked it up, you know, yeah. I'll have a small amount of regret there, but not that much, like, in a, in a way, making a bad decision is almost a form of run bad, because, you know, I ran bad to get in a situation that I was uncertain about, <laughs> which is, you know, it's, it's sort of, I've played so many tournaments, thought about these spots so much that even making a bad decision for the biggest part of my life wouldn't affect me that much but here when i'm you know i'm less confident in a lot of a lot of the spots i'm less you know well versed in you know uh in how the regs play and stuff like that when when i make bad decisions it eats me up a lot more and it makes me you know it makes me feel like i'm stupid and it makes me feel like a failure like way more than making the same types of mistakes in tournaments so it was it definitely like i mean one of the rules is that i'm not allowed to get coaching during the challenge i think like with coaching it certainly would have you know it would have helped there um but as it was it was just kind of you know watching you know run at once videos and then talking i was allowed to talk hands with friends but i couldn't do like session reviews or anything like that so it was definitely uh i think that you know just kind of you know doing it largely on my own while having you know come some like other you know annoying stressful things going on in my life was I just, I don't know, I don't know. I'm, just, I'm just not as tough as I uh, thought I was. Annoying, stressful things. The, those, those things in the outside life always, uh, they always have an impact on your poker, on your poker game, Poppy. I know you, you try, you try to avoid them, but it's, it's tough to separate, you know, your job from your life at times. For sure. What kind of, uh, what kind of stuff are you going through? Uh, I don't, I'd rather not talk about it. Ah, oh, I think. Okay. I think I have an idea. I have an idea. I might have an idea. Is it, is it, uh? It's two major things. I think you know one of them. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that one yeah. thing is a big thing when it comes to poker and being focused and being in the zone and, and working hard and having a, a one-track mind sort of thing. When you're dealing with this other thing, that shit gets in the way. That's hard to deal with, man. So. Yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, no, definitely, uh, definitely can be annoying. Yeah. So let's talk about yeah, Nopal know. Nopaleva during the 51K. So 51K happens. There's a guy named Nopaleva at the, yeah. at the final table, a guy from Russia. Who his mm. shark scope? It it appears like it's maybe a losing player. It appears a little fishy. You make a tweet. Little bit, little bit of a ski slope going on there. Yeah. Yeah. He. You make a tweet that says, uh, "I think the one hand per rule thing might be getting broken right now," which turns out isn't even a rule anymore. Apparently. I know. I always I always thought it was a rule, one player to a hand, but apparently there is no one player to a hand rule. Um, so I just kind of made that as like, this is before I even registered the tournament, or maybe it was after I registered, but it was, I hadn't even been to this table. I just had all the tables open and was, you know, asking a few friends how he was playing and stuff like that. And basically, you know, the general consensus is that like, you know, this, this guy is not playing the way that someone who gets massacred at $17 sit and goes and MTTs would play. Like, I, th I think this is something that a lot, like, so I've, I spend a lot of time on shark scope kind of analyzing people's, you know, history, trying to figure out, you know, what people play like just try to like when i see a name i don't know i just kind of like getting a rough idea of what their play history is like and just try to figure out you know who's a pro who's not what people play who's going to be scared who's going to be you know super confident all that stuff and basically I, i've looked through thousands of <laughs> profiles and this one is just like it i mean so first of all i'm not i didn't realize what spin and go graphs could look like you know, spin and goes are just not something that many of my friends play. And I didn't really realize that, you know, the spin and go graphs of a professional are likely going to show them as a loser unless they've hit a big spin and go, <laughs> which is kind of outrageous. Uh, but it seems it seems to me that the guy is like, OK, at spin and goes and maybe like tilts when he plays MTTs or I don't know, something like that, because even his MTT graph was pretty fucking bad. And a lot, like, it's not just like bad in the way that like a professional who's on a downswing would be bad. It's just like it's bad in the way that like, you know, my my dad plays poker recreationally <laughs> just for fun. And if you were to look at his graph, way better. Like it would just be night and night and day difference of uh, like, it's like, it's just like you look at it and it's like, this is the graph of sort of a break even player who maybe, you know, crushes $5 games, small loser at, you know, $20 games or something like that. But you can still be like, all right, you know, this guy just is breaking even, you know, just earning stars some rake. And the no believer graph is just way worse. Like it's just like this, this guy could definitely get some uh, some uh, some lessons from Rick McDonald, I think. 
and it, it's, it's, it's shout out to your dad, by the way. Yeah, give me a Rick a shout yeah. out, man. Shout out to Rick. Yeah, my my dad's probably watching this right now. So hey, hey, dad, how's it going? Uh, but basically, like the the note believer graph was just Im- impressively bad, and then to end up in a fifty k, like most people who play like that, like you know, probably every single person you know listening to this like podcast is involved enough in poker that they're just they're not going to get like even though probably most people listening are losing poker players they're not hugely losing poker players and they're the type of people who might kind of if not for rake maybe they'd win or whatnot but like this was just like a like it was just a ski slope um so the fact that like and when you play with someone like that you can often tell like within one orbit like this is a fun player kind of and that he just you know in that tournament just didn't play like a fun player I don't know. It was like, it, and again, it doesn't really matter because there is no one player to a hand rule or anything. So my my original tweet was definitely wrong. Uh, but like, yeah, I don't know. A couple things from that. So people are a little yep. a little bit upset because you you made an allegation that without any substantial proof, like you know him sending you a PM on two plus two saying, "Hey, uh, I'm not playing on my account today." So you didn't have something like that, unfortunately, in this situation. But. Mm-hmm. But people got upset at you. They they seem to be upset that you were shining light, or you questioned this, or you said this, and stuff like that. I don't understand why you're upset. Like it seemed like a very when you looked at the graph, it seemed like a very fair question to ask. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things where it's not like I'm, like you know, this this is something that people like may not realize is like I have no power. Like I might have some Twitter followers, but I, in in this whole world, I have no power over anything. I don't make any decisions. And you know, I my views are my own. My views are not the views of Poker Stars security or anything like that. And you know, I'm I'm just a guy who thinks a guy is playing better than he should. Like I don't fucking choose whose account gets banned and whose doesn't. And my opinion is that hey, this guy's playing you know better than I would expect a fun player to play kind of thing. Like it was you know, and it it turns out the guy like is a pro play you know plays like live cash and stuff like that. Uh, but basically, you know, I was I was just making a prediction. Um, my prediction, like, I mean, well, first of all, I, even if my prediction was right, the rules are different than I thought they were. Um, but yeah, basically, like, I'm not, I'm not in a spot where my opinion even really matters. I just like thought it was, you know, thought it was entertaining, thought it'd be like a funny tweet to make, and you know, there's just not a, it wasn't intended to be a big thing. Like, I just, I don't know, I just express my views. I if I was, was a spon- if I was a sponsored player or something, you know, I'd you know keep my mouth shut. Like I would, but like you know, I don't really. I mean, I like I, basically, I'm in a spot where if I'm happy with what Poker Stars is doing, I'll say it. If I'm unhappy with what Poker Stars is doing, I'll say it. Like I don't, you know, I'm never gonna get a sponsorship or any of that shit. So I just kind of, I feel like I am, you know, a true pro poker player in that I just tell it like it is. You know, I'll, you know, you know like I'll compliment stars when they do something that I approve of, you know, I'll rip into them when they do something I think is shitty. And I just kind of want to, you know, express, you know, my thoughts on any situation I see and not have to worry about, you know, uh, any sort of filter. Mm. You mentioned how you're, you're, when you speak, you don't speak for poker stars, right? You said something like that, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm not even sure if some of the people that actually work for poker stars when they speak, speak for poker stars <laughs> follow with, Follow some recent uh, things that happened with EPT Barcelona and some comments Lee Jones made about Jason Moe, and he said he w- he doesn't speak for Poker Stars either in that in instance. So I'm not sure if anyone actually speaks for Poker Stars anymore. So yeah, exactly. This is uh, I guess they're yeah they're probably in a pretty good situation where the like the the entity that is Poker Stars you know ha- has no voice, can't be touched, can do no wrong. I guess that's uh, that's maybe where they're at right now. I guess so, man. You know, you got people when things happen, they're not they're not allowed to speak out, or they they don't speak out because of certain things. I mean, it's just mm-hmm. it's it's interesting times in the world of poker stars right now. It's it's very interesting times. Yeah, it's uh, I don't know. It's it's definitely it's definitely strange how all these situations get handled. Like you know, the Barcelona situation, any of the you know any of the cheating or botting scandals. Like basically. Nothing, there's never an announcement where poker stars like we banned the following accounts for the following reasons like everything is just done like hush hush mm-hmm. like i'm sure there have been i'm sure like you know to go over you know the like hasting situation i'm sure there have been a hundred things more substantial than that where people just you know didn't get involved in two plus two didn't get involved in like you know social media talking about it and it was all just kept under wraps like i'm sure there have been way uh bigger scandals than that 
that never, you know, made it into the public eye that because poker stars never, you know, they like when they ha- when they discover like a cheating ring, they never have, they're not incentivized to publicize it. Like they just want to keep it all hush hush. Like, you know, they if they if they don't pay someone their money, they could get sued or something. You know, basically they just really, you know, don't they just they just don't want to police things as much as the player pool would like them to police things. Hmm. I'd be curious to see, uh, you know, obviously there's the cheating rings, there's bot rings, there's, I'm sure there's more bot rings out there. I'm sure you played against some bots at 2-5 Zoom. I mean, if there's bots playing 1-2 and 2-4 and 3-6 Pilo on stars, there's definitely bots playing 2-5 Zoom on stars, so. Yeah, this is gonna, this is gonna be the, the greatest feeling ever when I go and get a, get a 13k refund, and then the guys who won that proper, that prop bet off me, you know, have to ship back 600% of a 13k refund. That would be, that'll, that'll be a satisfying feeling. If I find out I was making, you know, 0.01 BB per hundred with, uh, if not for bots, then I'll pat myself on the back. And, you know, af- after losing that challenge, I changed my note color on stars from a, a top reg note to the very bad reg note. And I decided I'm not, I'm not, cha- I'm not changing it back until I feel I've earned it. And you know, I'm still at a very bad reg. If I if I got that win rate up to 0.01 BB, I might just get a bad reg note or something like that. But for for the time being, gotta stick with very bad reg. <laughs> Sad times, Poppy. Yeah, damn, man. Very bad reg note on yourself, huh? I know. Gotta get that constant reminder that I'm washed up. Ooh, what uh RPM says I've been wondering about that recently. No one really raises any suspicions at two five. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you gotta imagine if you're if you're a bot guy playing two five NL, like you know, there, there's got to be ways to to mask your your tells. Whereas the guy, the PLO bots, shout out to the bot makers. I know when you guys are watching right now. I want to give you a <laughs> shout out. I know, I know when you guys is connected to the motherfucking bot ring. You're doing it. You're obviously doing a great job. I, I wish you. I, I don't. I don't like you, but you're doing a great job. You're not detected. And uh, good luck relaunching your PLO bot, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, so I mean, he's obviously going to relaunch the PLO bot. He probably watches the podcast. I mean, it's just let's yeah. Just, it is. So, and. Uh, like the Nolman bots, like so when they caught the PLO bots with Russian PTR, which now they disallowed Zoom to be data mined. Star- Stars is great, man. They so the players catch the PLO bots using Russian PTR, and now they ban the Zoom hands being data mined on Russian PTR. It's a really strange coincidence and a really strange timing for all that happened, sort of thing. I didn't even put a- that together until now, but yeah, it really is just like you know they're looking out for number one, basically. Like you know, basically, if your poker star is the Effectively, what you want is everyone to lose at the same rate, no money to get taken out of the economy, and then just to have a few kind of like famous people advertising how you could be a poker pro like them. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, I mean, that's the ideal business model. Like, you don't want you don't want people like taking money out of the economy, and that's what every pro does. You just want it getting reinvested with this dream of making money. Uh, you know, I don't know what the number. I don't like. I would guess of like every dollar ever deposited to stars probably like i don't know somewhere between like 30 to 60 cents gets cashed out by pro poker players at some point and like you want it to be zero cents like you know they don't want if half the money that's been put into online poker gets cashed out because professionals profit it like why wouldn't poker stars want to double their margins and make just you know the the job of pro poker player not exist you know i think that that's kind of that's the dream for them I know, man. This is sad. I mean, spinning goes. I, I think I was watching a spinning go <laughs> streamer on Twitch the other day. There was a seven dollar buy in, three handed, and it was a fourteen dollar prize pool. I'm like, <laughs> I, I, I still don't know yeah, if I saw that's that. How you get the no believe let me know if I'm wrong. Please let me know if that's not right because I'm I'm almost positive I saw a fourteen dollar prize pool for a seven dollar spinning go. I just don't understand how it's possible. Like I. I they have all in shootouts now where you you only go all in every hand. They got the sport <laughs> betting. I mean, it's uh sad times we live in. Yeah, it is, man. Roller course says one with this podcast speed up. Need to have this one locked up. So if you guys want to watch this back, if you're on uh, if you're on Twitch, you can watch back from the beginning. I'll put the link in the description or I'll put the link in the chat right now that you can find on my YouTube channel as well. Uh Bruno Puppy, what's up? All right, I have to give a couple real shout outs here. Real shout outs here. Bruno Malavazali, what's up, puppy? Epicurious, he said I could listen to Mike talk all day. Yeah, man. Do you ever just think about maybe just releasing a stream of you just talking? People would listen to it, I think. Uh, I don't know if I'm that uh, self-indulgent. I think uh, I I don't know. I think probably not. Hmm, probably not. Okay. Uh, probably, Sad probably, times I don't know. Sorry, sorry, Epicurus Poppy. I, I'm, I'm 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 flattered that someone thinks that. Very flattered. I'd be flattered too if someone said that about me, man. 
pretty nice stuff. Uh, who we got? Ride J. Ride J. What's up, Ride J? Arnie, what's up, Arnie? Shout out to you. Shout out to Matilda. Matthew Hodgson. Mohammed Sabura. You posted the weirdest photo ever in the group the other day on Facebook, uh, but that's okay. Shout out to you. <laughs> Fucking weird photo, honestly. Rafael Naguera. What up, puppy? I think I saw my boy Mark Kennedy in the chat earlier. Max Silver in the chat. What's up, guys? Welcome, welcome. Where uh, what, what's what's his next six month look like poker life wise? Yeah, you're going to AP, you're going to Malta, you said. Uh yeah. So I'm go I'm doing Malta. Uh, I'll likely do uh, WPT Montreal. Um, I'll do Prague, PCA, and Aussie Millions, and then probably Monaco after that. So yeah, I guess probably you know about a trip it. every month, month and a half. Yeah, <laughs> that's a fair it, huh? bit. Yeah. <laughs> Lambo's yeah, not usually, getting much. Uh, you're not getting much chance to drive to Lambo with, with this kind of schedule. It sounds like. Yeah, I mean, well, luckily, you know, it snows all winter, and I never really drive it in the winter, anyways. So, kind of, you know, maybe at Malta, I'll be, you know, I'll be missing the Lambo. But after that, I'll probably, you know, put it away for the winter, and you know, won't get it. Won't get a ton of uh, driving in. How's the uh, how's the Lamborghini you own doing? For those of you know, Mike uh, has this has this really badass Lamborghini. He drives around, picks up the picks up the women, and of course, is that what you is that what you do in the is that what you do in the Lambo? Um, I mean, I th like this summer, uh, or I guess well, whatever. Since since being single, the Lambo has not gotten me laid. Uh, there's not a single there's not a single time this summer where I would say that. You know, I've gotten laid in a situation where if I didn't have a Lambo, I wouldn't have gotten laid. Uh, so it, it, historically, like, you know, last time I was single, there were a few <laughs> situations. Uh, but this, you know, a fucking, you know, cold streaks happen. Wow. Even you can go on a downswing with a Lambo, man. Yo, what, what, what well, do other guys out there who got the Civic have, man? I mean, I think it's, I'll call it a break-even stretch. You know, it's not, it's not really a downswing. Previous, actually, at one point, I did have a downswing where I would have gotten laid, except I had a Lambo and didn't get laid. And this was like, this was, this was a downswing right there. Uh, I was, I was talking to this chick who like lives in a, you know, lives in a, a different city. And, you know, I apologize to, you know, my mom and dad when they hear this story, but actually my dad will probably find it funny. Uh, but basically this girl was like, this girl was like texting me, like, you know, like, you know, dirty texting, saying about all the places, you know, she likes having sex. And I'm not going to lie. I like having sex in a bed. Like, uh, I think that, you know, I'm not adventurous. Just like beds were made to have sex in. And that's where, that's where I believe sex should usually occur. And she's saying shit like sex up in a tree. And all, I mean, all this like absurd places, you know, sex in a church. Like, and she says her favorite place Wait, to have sex, sex is in a tree. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's absurd. The things she's like listing. And like, basically she says her favorite place to have sex is in cars. And like, I think sex in a car is terrible. I've also tried, like, I've since tried to have sex in my Lambo, and there's not enough space in it. Uh, but basically, you know, we're talking, and I'm like, you know, I, I have, I have had sex in my other car. But basically, uh, she's, she like, she says, oh, but my favorite place to have sex is in cars. And I'm like, well, you know what? I've actually never had sex in the Lambo. And she's like, she flips out. She's like, I get it. I get that you're rich and successful, but that doesn't mean you need to like rub it in our face, in, pe in people's face. Like you can be like such an asshole. And I'm just like, what the fuck? Like it was like everything was just going fine, and I just simply said, you know what? I've never had sex in my Lambo before, and she got so mad, and like you know, never end up sleeping with this girl. Well, I mean, she did. She didn't preface this by saying, oh, I like to have sex in a tree. So, yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I like to have sex in a tree. Past sex at that in point. A church. And she, yeah, she said she'll have sex in a tree, but she'll flip her shit when someone's like, hey, I've never had sex in my Lambo. So that was the one Lambo downswing I've had where, you know, had I not had a Lambo, probably would have had sex. But since I had a Lambo, you know, I, I spent, I spent, the, I, I didn't spend the night playing chess. Couple questions, a couple follow ups, actually. One, did you really have a downswing, though? Pardon me? Did, did you really have a downswing in this in this scenario? Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure if if I was just like, oh well, we could have sex in my Lexus, she'd be like, all right, I'll be there in five. But like, think I'm, about I'm, it. Think about it though. Did you really have a downswing if you avoided this situation with this young woman? Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, I'm just saying if the if we take the you know the count the count like I'm sure it's a good life decision that this didn't happen. Like I'm sure you know this, there's no way this is going to be a real positive life experience. You know, spending more time with you know someone who's this uh, emotionally volatile. Right. But I'm just saying if we're purely counting the uh, 
you know occasions and things like that this this was the the one situation that caused uh that caused a downswing you know i want to have sex in a tree too now that now that we're talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think about this. How do I? How do you have sex in a tree? In a tree, she said. In a tree, she have sex in a tree. It, it might have been in a tree house, or I don't know something. Like, tree house. Oh, oh now we're changing the story. Either way, like, either way, it was up. A, either way, in a tree was some like you know, you know. Again, you know, I think, I think a bed is fine, dandy, comfortable. A tree, none of those things. In a tree. In a fucking tree, like I get in the, and you climb up the tree. I'm just like in the tree. Like, I mean, you know, listen. Anyone's if anyone's in, let me know. You know, if anyone's interested in having sex in the tree, like give me a shout out. You know, uh, stalkers are welcome. Stalker, let me know. This is the time to get your stalker out there. Mike, you recently got a stalker message on uh, on Facebook. Can I read it for the people? A stalker mess. I mean, which like if it's something that you don't think is appropriate, don't show it. But if it's something like I get a lot of weird messages, and I'm not sure which ones I've shown you. I just uh, want to read this one. You posted this one on Twitter. Oh, then it's perfectly fine then. Yeah. If it's All right, public. This is, this is a message Mike got on Twitter. He got this in three separate occasions as well. I find this oh, yeah. odd. He says, hey, do you know me? But may, you don't, you do not know me, but maybe you can help me. Some time, some time ago, a colleague who sells pot asked me to preserve his money because he had problems. However, my house was robbed and now he wants the money back. In the meantime, my girlfriend who does not know got home after my grandparents got home after my grandparents who wants to renovate and who wants to take a loan my work does not give me such income that would allow me to cope with such a loan you could not lend me around 25k question mark i will not lie but i will give for a month or two because i think i could be that after six or seven years i work as a technician at the networks and i'm a recreational poker player i know you probably get hundreds of messages but it can happen this is a true story and i'm fucked if you could help me here is my skill <laughs> What? What's happening here, Mike? What you get messages like this a lot on, on Facebook or what? Uh, it happens occasionally. So you know, I was I was uh, I was able to help the guy out a little bit. I think I I think I maybe sent him about five grand or so, and then he responded nice to me you. a little while later saying, you know, now he only needs twenty grand the second time because you know my my five helped pay it down. Um, so you know that was that was you know pretty pretty generous of me. Um, yeah, and then, was, you know, that was nice of you. Yeah, you know, I, the next time he asked for twenty, the next time he only asked for five. That was pretty sweet of you to give him. Yeah, 20. you know, then I gave him that second installment of the next fifty. <laughs> so you know, that was you know, help pay him from. You know, I assume maybe hey, if I get the first twenty, maybe someone else will get the last five. So after my second installment of fifteen thousand, then he hit me up again a few months later, only asking for five. And then I was like, oh man, it sucks. Like I thought, I thought maybe someone else would help chip into such a good cause. But you know, then I just you know hit him up with the final five, and now it's all paid down. Probably no more uh, no more messages from this guy. But you know, it was uh, it was a good situation. I was able to. I mean, he's no longer fucked. I probably saved his life. <laughs> you know, how rich do you have to be to give this give this nice guy some money like that? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, uh, it was it seemed like a good cause. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I obviously I get a lot of messages like this too. I I probably given out at least ten thousand dollars to people. <laughs> with the best stories, you know, over time, if they ask me for things like this. So I understand people get in some really tough spots in their life. So, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like as, as people who might be a little bit luckier than other people are, you know, it's sort of our duty to be altruistic and help out, right? Yeah, ex exactly. And, the, you know, this seemed like, uh, you know, the most, uh, the most viable cause. No, I definitely agree with that. I definitely agree with that. Guys, we got about uh, 12 more minutes left. Let me get some questions from the chat here. I know you guys have been asking some questions all, all the time, but... Uh, yeah, you know what? Someone said I'm like an, uh, a news reporter. I, I kind of think of myself like Oprah. I'm going to start calling myself the Oprah poker. That's what I'm going to start calling myself because I'm going to start giving out, uh, you know, I already, I'm going to start giving out cars to people. I'm going to start, I've already given cash to people. Obviously, you're a little like Oprah. You're giving out cash to guys like this too. So, yeah, he probably bought a car with that cash. So, you know, I think it was, I think it was, you know, I'm, we're kind of both like Oprah. Yeah. We're very helpful. I need, have, I need 25K for Sex Tree. Please send. For a sex tree. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. All right, guys. We're gonna take uh we'll take a couple questions here. Respond to my twist message, please. Who we got in the chat, man? We got some stream we got some other streamers in the chat. We got Rust Rock. What up, Rust? Well, so we saw I know we saw Fitton in the chat earlier. What up, Fintin, Fintin, my girl Blair. What's up, Blair? You know there's girls on Twitch, Mike, you can meet? I, b I believe it, yeah. You gotta get in you gotta get you gotta get in Twitch, man. You play you gotta do Prismata. Does Prismata have many girls in, in the Prismata streets? A very small number of girls. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I think that there's. I'm so, I'm so busy as it is right now that I'm I'm not really in a spot where I'm trying uh, trying too hard at the moment. 
maybe maybe once I become even more washed up and I'm not even trying at poker, then I'll you know then I'll be like uh, like lurking around on Twitch trying to meet girls. But I'm I'm all right for now. Yeah. Uh, my name ain't Earl. What up? My name ain't Earl. What up, Poppy? Bro fest. Uh, you little weird, but what's up, man? Thank you for keeping commenting and 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 grinding through. A lot of people start off on Twitch. They start off commenting real weird, and then they, but they push through. Once you let them know you're weird, they 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 start improving, improving, improving over time. And I, and I'm seeing some good change from you, bro. Fest, keep it up, man. Keep up the uh, keep up the positive. Who's gonna be the first Lance? If, if you are Oprah, who's gonna be the first Lance Armstrong? Who's the first? Who's the Lance Armstrong of poker? Uh, so I. I don't get the connection between Oprah and Lance Armstrong. Uh, I'm not sure either. <laughs> I'm not sure. We. I think Oprah uh, might have had Lance Armstrong on her show. So maybe yeah. I, who would be my first Lance Armstrong type guest? Okay, gotcha. Um, yeah, I, I honestly, I, I, I can't even. I'm not. I'm not creative at, with things like this. Like I'm sure. I'm sure a funny person could come up with a funny answer, but I'm not very funny or creative. Mm. Yeah, I disagree. I think you're very funny and creative, Poppy. Do you I'll see your tweets them. you make? They're funny and creative. They get all these favorites and retweets. Of course they're funny and creative, right? Oh man, the, and then hate and then hate messages. I'll get, you know, ten favorites and a hundred hate messages over the no believer thing. You know, it's mm. man, people people do not like that. I don't understand why they didn't like it though. I mean, are, like how fucking dumb are people? Now they're gonna get upset because you're tweeting out like, oh, this could be like have they been paying attention to online poker the past like six yeah, years just, just like, trying to protect the integrity of the games and shit like that like it's i don't know i think it's just kind of a lot of people basically i think it's sort of a lot of people can like relate to his situation like they're you know they're losing players themselves who still want to win a million dollars in a tournament and they can kind of you know live vicariously through this other losing player winning a million dollars in a tournament uh i guess that's kind of, you know they they want to like you know they want to root for the underdog because it gives them faith that they're not just wasting their time in poker is I think is I think what it kind of boils down to. It's much easier to root for him than it is to like you know root for you know someone with a dream machine that they're using to crush the games. Do you really think a lot of poker players that are out there right now that are losing really think they're wasting their time in poker? I feel like they they feel like they think their chance is coming. They're just unlucky. <laughs> No, that's what I mean. I'm saying that, like, maybe in the back of their head they question it, but, like, they all think that this is, like, a productive use of their time kind of thing. I mean, and poker is less than a zero-sum game, which is what's so crazy about it. Like, it's it's such a, you know, basically, I mean, ignoring the entertainment value, and the entertainment value is substantial. Like, whatever, billions, maybe trillions of hours have been spent on poker to lead to... You know, just poker sites making money, and the rest of us in the rest of the our trillions of hours of time in total, you know, just have lost billions of dollars. So it's it's definitely uh, I don't know. On average, the time is not that productive, but every single person thinks it's a productive use of their time. Hmm, it's not ruining any dreams, today. Do you have a Hollywood Haxton impression for us? Uh, no, I, I I don't have a Hollywood Haxton impression, Ike, to, unfortunately. Is Ike here? Ike might be here. I right know. Ike. What are you, you're the beanbag. What's he doing in the beanbag? He's working on some simulations right now. You, Timex is here, man. Mike McDonald, you want to come say hi? Yeah. All right, let me know. Let me, we got 10 minutes. Let me know. Let me know. All right, all right. We might get Ike over here. Ike might come on and make an appearance. Is I, I, I was sure this was leading into a joke where you were going to do your Hollywood Haxton impression. Is Ike literally at your house right now? <laughs> is he? I don't know. Is he? I'm not sure. All right, all right. Well, uh, we'll we'll see we'll see where this one's going. He, he did he play the fifty one? Did he play the W Coop main event yesterday? Uh, I assume so. I don't know. Maybe he's maybe he is in the United States. Maybe he is in the beanbag chair today. What if he was in the beanbag chair today? Ooh, uh, <laughs> I guess I forgot where you are. For some reason, I thought you were out in Vancouver right now, but that's obviously not not the case. Okay, now it, it probably makes sense he's not on your bean bag chair. He's like on the bean bag chair. I mean, I sold it so well. It's, it's like on the bean bag chair. You so like in my head, you're in Vancouver or something where it could at least be sort of plausible. <laughs> like you guys are both in PLO, uh both, you know, relocated Americans, but now that I remember that you're in the states, I uh I guess he's probably not <laughs> he's probably not over on his dream machine on the bean bag chair. He's got his fucking he's got his Mac computer set up with a with another extension computer, the dream machine set next to it. He's just running running simulate. He's got he's got the where's he got? 
He's got the glasses on. He's just like running for it. You know, he's doing the I call it an accent type stuff like that. You know, it's uh, oh man, you know. Okay, oh, more guys. Uh, I'll let people know we got a, a couple more podcasts coming up. We're uh, doing a podcast on Friday with Luke Schwartz, aka Full Flush, the man, the myth, the legend himself. And uh, next Monday, we're going to have on Ben eighty six, Ben Tallerine, one of the podcast favorites of all time. We're going to talk about his fifty one k w his w coop win victory he took down, and we'll talk about his bunch of other things with Ben. And um, next Friday, we have the man behind Twitch Poker Rum Cakes, who is the man who helped bring poker to Twitch. Scott Ball, we're going to have him on too. Actually, both Scott Ball and Ru- and Ben joined me yesterday on the W Coop main event final table stream we did. And um, I think Monday after that, we're going to have uh, Jeff Gross on a podcast. Do you know much about Jeff Gross, uh, Mike? Uh, I mean, you know, met him, like played with him a handful of times, like hung out with him a little bit, but don't know him particularly well or anything. Yeah, I don't either. I met him at Antonio Esfandiari's house when I did the podcast with him that one time. So it's weird how like you you go you do these like podcasts sometimes and you like meet one person there and then down the road that sort of turns into like it's like a this little like web of fucking uh, I don't know. Do you have a, do you have two podcast guest recommendations that you would suggest that I get on that I might not have had on that would be fun, entertaining, that people would enjoy? Hmm. I mean, I think a lot of a lot of my close friends have already have already been on here. Um, have you ever had Connor Drynan on? I don't think Connor. Then Connor. Connor said he wants to. He doesn't want to come on. He wants to be. He wants to say okay, stay yeah. under the radar because uh, he would have been a recommendation. Um, let me think of who else I think would be good. Um, uh, you've already had PLP on. That's uh, you know you, you can always just get PLP back on. That's uh, he's always a fun guest. Um. I'm not. Sh- I'm not sure. I'll. I'll think about it and get back to you. Like I. I. I mean, I think you guys have like a really strong list of people as it is, and most of the guys I know are you know more in the tournament community than the PLO community. It seems like you know the the viewers are very you know PLO focused, I guess. Uh, but I'll. I'll keep it. I'll keep it in mind if I think of anyone that would be you know a good guest that you might not have thought of. Gracias, Poppy. Gracias. Um, do we? Do we? Can you ask Mike's opinion on Jason Mo? Uh, so let, I guess, I guess the question is like, could I, could you be more specific about like, do it, is it, you know, do I, uh, you know, like him as a person? Do I approve of his tweets or like, what do, what do I think of his game? Like more specifically, do you like him as a person? Uh, I like in real life, I like him as a person on the internet. I don't like him as a person. Like, I think he's, I mean, basically Jason, here's Jason Mo is, he is the perfect, like, he's like the poster boy for, like, an internet tough guy. <laughs> like, he is just someone who's, like, you know, he'll rip into people so hard. And he he really gets off on this, like, villain persona. Like, he, he probably enjoys being mean to people behind the computer more than anyone I've ever met. And then in person, he's just, you know like mostly a nice guy, not very confrontational, like not, you know, so there, there are a very small number of people that he'll be a dick to in person, but like, you know, behind, like he is like the, the, like overall I like Jason, but he is just way too much of an internet tough guy and just gets, gets in fights for no reason. Like he suspects someone's cheating and then just like states that they're cheating. Like it's a fact. And, you know, I think he's really, you know, it's like, He's like the only guy I know who it seems like they try to make enemies for the sake of making enemies. So I can, t- like, I think I, I think I like Jason more than like ninety nine percent of the community. But he is just, he's just too mean to people. Well, I guess that. Um, I don't know. I always tell Jason that he's probably mean, but he always like I'm pretty nice, and I always say I don't think you're that nice. But he's nice to me. I, I, I you know, I think he's a pretty nice guy to me, but. He definitely is not nice to some people, but you could argue he's just honest, and being honest to sometimes his honesty is mean. I th- I think it's I think it often goes kind of past being honest. Like I think it's sort of like there are times when he like suspects someone of cheating where it's plausible they are cheating. I mean, basically, it's much much stronger accusations than my no believe a thing, where it'll be like people in his community that you know he starts saying are scumbags because they've cheated and they haven't cheated kind of and that that's one of those things that like you know no believe it probably hates me right now even though i like if you look at this set you know the set of the amount of information i had and the conclusion i drew he could maybe understand how it's a logical conclusion and even if you know even if i was wrong it's still just one of those things where you know it feels like 
a somewhat personal attack. And as a result, you know, it's kind of reasonable that he wouldn't like me. And I think when Jason's done this stuff like this several times, even like the, the times when he is right, you know, people will probably hate him a fair bit just because he called them out. But the times when he's wrong, the people especially hate him because they value, you know, their reputation being viewed as ethical. And if someone's, you know, calling them a cheater, saying they play on other accounts, it like, it really, it really like digs into you when someone accuses you, accuses you of lying when you haven't lied. And I think that that's, you know, that's something that, uh, like, even though he's stating his opinion and, you know, wanting to be honest, if he isn't right 100% of the time, it really, you know, makes, uh, makes people, you know, not feel good about that. Well, guys, on that note, we're going to wrap this up. I got to go to the doctor. Got to get luck it with the shoulder, man. Yeah, man, we'll see what happens. It feels good. It feels good, but we're going to do a couple more things, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, guys in the chat, much love. Thanks for tuning in. If you want to catch the podcast back, if you're watching this on Twitch, you can watch it back on YouTube. The link, you can click on my YouTube channel below, or the link is right now in the description. Guys on Twitch, guys on YouTube, we'll be back on Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern. Luke Short's full flush. If you want to follow Timex on Twitter, it's at MikeMCDonald89, MikeMcDonald89. He always tweets them out some good stuff. He gets a lot of favorites. He gets a lot of likes you know it's got to be good. So, Mike, thank you for coming on, Poppy. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, no, it's always fun being on here, and uh, good luck getting to play chess up in a tree. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. All right, kid, take it easy, man. Peace. All right, see you later, man.